All right. Okay, everyone, let's, let's get started again. Okay, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I, I learned in the break, uh, Alice? Alice taught me how to use the boards, and so if I do it right, it's all thanks to her. Uh, if I mess it up, it's entirely my stupidity. Um, okay, so I, was, I fell a little behind in the first half, uh, but I'll try to, I'll, I'll not worry about what I missed, and I'll just go on to what I want to talk about, and we'll see if it comes back to bite me. Um, so I wanted to talk about these three applications. Uh, one is in commutative algebra, one is in number theory, and one is in algebraic topology. And so let me begin with the most elementary one, which is uh, the commutative algebra application. Uh, and the statement here is extremely simple, so I thought I would just write it down for you. Um, and so here's, here's the theorem. Uh, this is from 2020. Uh, and it concerns the polynomial ring in n variables. So R is going to be, let's say, Z adjoin x1 through xn um, over the integers. And then uh, the object that we're going to prove something about is R plus, which is uh, defined to be the integral closure of R in an algebraic closure of its fraction field. OK, so this is some huge object. Uh, it's not finite, gener finally generated over R. What you're supposed to do is you look at the algebraic closure of the fraction field. And then you look at every element in there that satisfies a monic polynomial over R, and you throw that into the ring, and that's this ring R plus. In some sense, it's a bookkeeping device. It's a bookkeeping device for talking systematically about the collection of all possible uh, finite covers uh, of your space, the space being, uh, I guess, uh, n-dimensional affine space uh, over the integers. And so what do, what do we prove about this? Uh, so the theorem is. There are various formulations. I will write down probably the easiest one first. Uh, so R plus is, well, OK, maybe this is not the easiest one, but this is the easiest one to say. R plus is piadically Cohen Macaulay. And so what does this mean? Uh, this is a very explicit uh, property. Uh, so what this means is the following. So if you look at the sequence, which starts off with p, which I'm going to label x0. So it's convenient to think of uh, p as being x0. So it's one of the variables, uh, except it's not a variable, uh, x1 through xn. So if you look at the sequence of n plus 1 elements of the ring r, uh, then the claim is that this is a regular sequence on r plus. And so what does being a regular sequence mean? It means that the first, whoops, OK. Uh, it means that the first one is a non-zero divisor, and the second one is a non-zero divisor on the quotient by the first one, and then the third one is a non-zero divisor on the quotient by the first two, and so on. And so explicitly in symbols, it means xi is a non-zero divisor, meaning multiplication by xi is injective on r plus mod x0 up through xi minus 1. Another way to say it, which is maybe more appealing to geometers, uh, is that r plus mod p is flat over r mod p. Um, and another way to say it, which uh, is maybe more appealing to uh, people that like cohomology, is that a certain cohomology group vanishes. So H, cohomology in degrees less than n plus 1, supported at the ideal of the variables of uh, R plus is 0. <coughs> so this is what's called local cohomology. It's a quantity that's studied a lot in uh, commutative algebra. And essentially, the vanishing of local cohomology characterizes when something is Cohen-Macaulay. And so whence the sequence of equivalences. Uh, but really, the result is just the first one. OK, so, so that's the theorem. Uh, why do I think this is interesting? So maybe I'll make some remarks on this. So the first remark is, I guess, maybe 
some special cases are easy. So very small n. So the dimension of the ring is n plus 1. And so when n plus 1 is 2, I guess that means n is 1, uh, elementary. Meaning if you've seen the first course in commutative algebra, you could try to prove this on your own. Uh, it will work out. Um, but basically, for any bigger n, so already for n equals uh, 2, uh, I, this theorem is quite difficult. As far as I know, it uses the full strength of modern integral piatic Hoss theory. And it would be quite, I think, interesting uh, to find sort of an easier proof of it. Uh, OK, so that's something about the proof. But like, why is it interesting? So this result implies uh, something else, which was uh, known, but only recently, uh, which was quite important. So this theorem implies what's called the direct sum and conjecture. So this was uh, something uh, proven by Yves Andre in 2016. It was a result that was conjectured by Mel Hoxter uh, in print in the early 70s, and I think uh, in practice uh, a few years before that. Uh, it's sort of a conjecture that drove a lot, huge fraction of the research in commutative algebra in the last 50 years. Uh, it finally fell to perfectoid techniques in Andre's work, uh, and it immediately follows uh, from this theorem. And so let me just tell you what the statement is. So the statement is, if, if you take this big, big guy, R plus, which is like a union of all possible finite extensions, stare, stare at one of them. So if S inside R plus is a finitely generated R algebra, so you only adjoin solutions of finitely many uh, polynomial equations, then uh, what the theorem says is that the map you have from R to S, just the inclusion map, uh, splits. as R modules, meaning it has a, there's a map back from S to R, which is R linear, and the composition is the identity. So it's a very innocuous statement, uh, and therefore very tempting to try to just prove by hand. And all attempts to do so have so far uh, met a brick wall. Um, and it's, it's, it's not so hard to deduce uh, that version, this theorem, from this theorem by just some easy arguments with flatness. Um, great. Uh, and the third remark I wanted to make, which is another reason one might care about this, is this vanishing uh, that I've written down over here is, so if you're a complex geometer, there's something called Kodaira vanishing. And the Kodaira vanishing theorem has a local analog, which is local Kodaira vanishing. And this is essentially a version of local Kodaira vanishing in this context. Uh, and so you might wonder if there's a global version. And there is, so you can globalize this and you get a global version of Kodaira vanishing as well. And that turns out to be very useful. So the global version of the theorem, which is Kodaira vanishing up to finite covers, Um, the reason I call it Kodaira vanishing up to finite covers is essentially like this. As I said, R plus is a bookkeeping device. What this theorem is really saying is that each time you meet a cohomology class that shouldn't be there, and for some S like in, on that board, some finitely generated algebra, then there's a bigger S where that cohomology class dies. So the global version says that if you take a cohomology group of the kind that shows up in the Kodaira vanishing theorem over the complex numbers in this mixed characteristic world, and if it's not zero, you can find a further finite cover where the class that shouldn't be there, in fact, goes away. And so this version of the theorem uh, has applications in birational geometry. And so the thing I have in mind is almost immediately after uh, this theorem uh, was proven, uh, two groups of authors, more or less independently, uh, used it uh, to sort of set up the minimal model program in dimension at most three in mixed characteristic. Uh, over Z. And so the groups, um, this, 
It's a long list, so I'll just put abbreviations. E-M-P-S-T-W-W-T-Y. And this is like six months after this paper. Uh, I guess I should spell out the names at least. So uh, Lin Chuan Ma, Joel Patak Falvi, Carl Schwed, Kevin Tucker, Joe Waldron, Jakob Vitajek, Tepe Takamatsu, and Sho Yoshikawa. All young people, all great people. Uh, sorry? Carl is senior. You consider him old? Uh, it's all downhill from here. Um, so the question is, does it say something about rational singularities and mixed characteristic? Oh, this theorem. Um, yeah, I think this theorem is basically trying to, ex I, one way to express it is saying that a regular ring has rational singularities. Or it's trying to do like an easy version of that in this world. So you can also do a derived version of this where instead of a finite cover, uh, you have a proper cover. And then you still demand that R splits off from the push forward of the structure sheaf. And that's also true. And that's much closer to rational singularities. Yeah. yeah, so this is the theorem. And it's, as I said, it's a pretty elementary statement uh, with a not very not elementary proof. And obviously, I cannot go into the proof uh, in this talk. Uh, all I can do is give you a very vague schematic, which explains how this relates to F gauges. Um, so what's the relevance of F gauges? Since I write big, I'm hoping this is OK. So this is necessarily vague, but I want to at least explain, give you a hint of what's going on. Um, so we had sort of, I mean, OK, let me say in words what's going on first. So, uh, we have the space R, which I'm going to just pretend is the, the polynomial ring, though really, secretly, you should be applying it to the p-adic completion of the polynomial ring. So you have F gauges on R. And it has this realization functor, which is the etal realization functor, to uh, local systems, ZP local systems, on R1 over P. Uh, this was part of the picture I had at the end of the previous talk. Now, ZP local systems on R1 over P has a natural enlargement. So in topology, working with local systems is slightly unnatural. The more natural category to work with is constructible sheaves, because that's stable under various geometric operations that local systems are not. So here you have constructible ZP local systems, uh, ZP sheaves on R1 over P. Uh, and there's something that's going to go over here. So the basic fact is there exists a natural open substack um, X prism inside this uh, syntomic version, uh, X sin. So I mentioned that quasi. Perfect complexes on the syntomification of a ring or a scheme are by definition F gauges. So this is the category of perfect complexes on R sin. What I'm asserting over here is that there's a natural open substack which carries a Frobenius endomorphism, meaning a lift of the Frobenius mod P. And so then what you can do is you can take an F gauge and it turns out that you can produce, a, I'll just say quasi co of X prism by a restriction uh, you can then pull back to the perfection. You can ignore this if you like. And the way the theory is set up, what you get is a Frobenius fixed point. So this is essentially some kind of a pullback functor. I'm not telling you the precise definitions, just giving you a picture for what's going on. And then uh, it turns out that the HL realization functor can actually be inverted over here. So there's a functor in this direction which we call a Riemann-Hilbert functor. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess I should, this is my joint work with uh, Jacob Lurie. Um, and so the reason we call this a Riemann-Hilbert functor is 
It's taking a topological object, like a constructible sheaf, and outputting an algebraic object, essentially a module over some very fancy ring. And using this functor, you can control the commutative algebra of the situation, like this quantity, r plus mod p over here, in terms of the topology of the generic fiber. And once you're in topology, you can make various arguments. And so technically, what you need is that this functor has good behavior with respect to perverse sheaves over here. They go to cohen macaulay complexes. But that's one of the uh, inputs of the proof. And so that's the relevance of F-cages uh, to this discussion. OK. So I think this is all I wanted to say about the commutative algebra application. Uh, are there any questions about it? I could, I love this, so I can keep talking about it, but I should try to do justice to my notes. So there are lots of other applications of hiatic Hodge theory to commutative algebra in the last few years. I just uh, want to tell you about one of them. Uh huh. Right. So I don't think I have a, we have a good answer to that yet, but this is some attempt at accessing it. Like that is somehow what's going on, which is, we are trying to figure out what additional structures local cohomology modules have. And one of the things we use is that if you work in sort of almost mathematics, a la fall things, then the local cohomology module lies in the image of this functor. So it sort of feels like a D module. Yeah. Yeah, actually, since Mikni is here, I should say, I think this idea of uh, trying to prove things of interest in commutative algebra, algebraic geometry, or Cohen Macaulay using stuff coming from topology uh, is something I learned from yours and uh, Christian's talks on uh, mixed hot modules. This is like a mod p version of it. Uh, yeah. Great. Other questions? OK, so if not, let me talk about the number theory application. So this is to Galois representations. And so. Uh, let me uh, fix the notation. So k is going to be qp, the field of p-adic numbers. The reason I'm calling it k is twofold. One is to avoid confusion, because this is the base I work over, not the coefficients. Like, it's the difference between the space versus the co coefficients of the cohomology theory. And the other is that everything I'm about to say should work for arbitrary ramified extensions, but uh, has not yet been fully written down. So. Finite extension should be okay. Um, okay, and then the basic question uh, that I would like to propose an answer to in this part is, is the following question, which is, what is a p-adic local system, or really a ZP local system, on OK, or its formal spectrum. Uh, I put it in quotes. I guess the quote should probably end here. Uh, I'm putting it in quotes because if you just take this as a mathematical concept, it has a definition. And the definition is inadequate. And really, we are searching for like the correct definition here. And so uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what doesn't work. So the easier version of this question is when you put ZL local systems, where L is a prime not equal to P. And when L is a prime not equal to P, Grothendi gave a definition of ZL local systems on any, on any space. Uh, they're always classified by representations of the fundamental group of that space. Uh, and it, that is a good thing to do over here. The examples of interest would be if you have a smooth projective scheme or a smooth projective variety over over such a space, its cohomology should be an example of a local system. It's like the Gauss-Mannin local system. And so for L not, L not equals to P, uh, ATL local systems work. But for L equals P, they don't work, basically, is the, is the punchline. So the observation is uh, ZL local systems a la Grothendieck are a good theory.
for L not equals P, but not for L equals P. And this is not some pathological thing. Already, if you look at the cohomology of P1 over spec OK, it's H2 uh, thought of as a ZL local system is not, well, it's in fact not a ZL local system. It's not an unramified representation. And so really the etal theory breaks down uh, if the coefficients interact with the ground field, which is why uh, th the answer to this question is not obvious. And I want to make a proposal and then give you some evidence for why that's a good proposal. And so proposed answer is you take F gauges. I mean, maybe that's not so surprising. So ZP local systems, I'm just going to define to be F gauges. And so let me try to justify that this is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so I will give you two pieces of evidence for this. And so the first piece of evidence uh, is going to be by a comparison with the case where we know how to define what ZP local systems mean, meaning, so we don't know how to define ZP local systems because this is an integral phenomenon. But in p-adic Hodge theory, Fontaine gave a pretty good definition of a QP local system. And we knew how to work with it. So with QP coefficients, meaning after you invert P and ignore torsion phenomenon, coefficients. So Fontaine had the following definition. And there's plenty of results suggesting it's a good idea. So, uh, which is uh, on the generic fiber. So after you invert P, there is a perfectly good theory of uh, ZP local systems, which is Galois representations. So therefore, there's also a perfectly good theory of QP local systems, which is uh, QP Galois representations of the absolute Galois group of K. So these are finite dimensional continuous representations from the Galois group of K into uh, GLN QP for some n. So those are local systems on the generic fiber. So the picture I have in mind is, Here's something like spoof OK. And then the generic point is some kind of fuzzy point over here. And we know what local systems should be over here. And we're trying to figure out what it means to extend them across the picture. And Fontaine's uh, has a suggestion, which is you look at uh, those Galois representations which are crystalline. So this is a very technical condition uh, defined using p adic Hodge theory. I'm not going to give you uh, the definition right now. But it's some subcategory of this abelian category where we sort of know it has a lot, all the good properties we would want a theory of local systems to have. And so this was supposed to be his, uh, his uh, proposed definition of QP local systems. On OK. And so that's one existing definition with enough evidence. Here I'm giving another definition with no evidence. And so the obvious theor question or theorem would be that if you take this definition and you invert P, how does it compare to this definition? And so there's a good theorem there. Ah, uh, oh, I messed it up again. Right. It's not a straight abelian category. And I will address that when I just write the theorem over here. Yeah, thank you. So the theorem is that the two definitions compare well. Uh, I guess this is also a joint work with Lurie. Um, you can find notes uh, on my web page uh, explaining this. And so yeah, the theorem is exactly what I said, except with the caveat that Barry just asked about. So here you look at F gauges over OK, which as I just said, was perfect complexes on some stack. So this was a definition. And I can just formally invert P over here in the category, meaning I just invert P in the HOM sets. So the objects remain the same, and HOMs get, uh, uh, become QP vector spaces. And the theorem is that this category is equivalent to the 
It cannot be Fontaine's category on the nose because this is an abelian category, whereas up there I'm talking about triangulated categories. But it's the next best thing, which is that it's the derived category of this abelian category. So it's the bounded derived category of crystalline representations of GK. Uh, and you can, you can read off, if you don't like derived categories and you want really a statement of the abelian level, the abelian version of this statement uh, would basically be that uh, crystalline Galois representations correspond to certain kinds of sheaves over here. Uh, and those sheaves are turn out to be reflexive coherent sheaves. Okay, sorry. And so, yeah, exactly. Sorry? Why reflexive? So, okay, it turns out the stack is three dimensional, roughly. It ha for example, it has a cover by an Ethereum regular scheme of dimension three. And in a three-dimensional scheme, if you look, think about vector bundles defined outside the close point, those don't always extend to vector bundles, but they always do extend to reflexive coherent sheaves. And that's roughly the source of ref reflexivity in this, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is one theorem, and it's already uh, useful. So if you know a little bit about uh, block cardo selmer groups, uh, those are groups that are defined using essentially this category over here. And what this theorem is suggesting is that those groups, which are a priori rational, rational groups, uh, have a natural integral structure that come from uh, F gauges. So you get some uh, integral form of the local block auto selmer group. Uh, so the theorem gives an integral version. I'm just writing this down for, for people that know what these words mean integral version of uh, H star sub F of GK. And it's really star, so there's an interesting H2 sub F, yeah, turns out. Um, okay, so that was one piece of evidence that we have found at least some reasonable candidate that interacts well with uh, this existing candidate. Uh, for me, actually, the more convincing piece of evidence uh, came from uh, something that I learned from from Barry, which is why are this uh, primes and knots analogy. So I want to at least very briefly tell you about it. And so I'm not an expert on this, and so please correct me if I say something wrong, but let me draw a table and use it to motivate a theorem. So this is, there's, sorry, there's an analogy relating number fields to topology where the role of uh, spec of a finite field uh, is taken up by a knot, and the role of spec Z is taken up by a three manifold, and then spec ZP is like a solid neighborhood of, of a knot and a three manifold. Uh, and so let me record how this table goes, or at least the relevant pieces of it for, for our purposes. So here's number theory. Ah, sorry. I'm just writing number theory. I want to have it over here, so let me. Uh, oops! No! 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 Okay, number theory and topology. Uh, ah. So here's spec FP. And as I was saying, this corresponds to a knot. S, I'm just going to think of a knot as S1 embedded inside a three manifold, which is spec Z in this case, but I will not give it a name. I'm only interested in the local part of this analogy. Uh, spec FP is sitting inside spec ZP because FP is a quotient of ZP. So on spec, it goes in the other direction. And the analog of that over here, or really I should say OK, because I'm I set up my notation over there. And really, this should be FQ. I apologize. It's the residue field. Um, so spec OK is like a solid neighborhood. Uh, M of this knot. So I don't know. Here's very, my very poor picture of what's going on. 
which is, this is the S1, which is the knot, and here's the, here's a solid neighborhood inside three space. Is that okay? I, sorry, it doesn't take much imagination to understand what I'm trying to say there. Uh, but this is a solid neighborhood, so it has a boundary, and the boundary corresponds to spec k. So this is the boundary, which is a Riemann surface. It's just this torus. Uh, let me actually switch the boards. Because I want to write a couple of entries still. Um, right, so I was interested in understanding local systems. So on this side, I can just think about a FP local system, say, on, this, uh, on, this, uh, on the boundary. So on this Riemann surface, which is something very reasonable, is representations of the fundamental group of that Riemann surface. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, on this side, the correct analog of uh, FP local systems is just representations of the Galois group of K because K is a characteristic zero object there. There's no ambiguity about what local systems means. And there's one additional piece of structure uh, in this analogy that I want to track, which is uh, duality. So on this side, since I'm on, if I think about the, the Riemann surface, which is this boundary, uh, it is a two-dimensional, uh, smooth, compact-oriented manifold with no boundary. And so it's, it has Poincaré duality. And you can also do Poincaré duality with local system coefficients. Uh, analogously, on this side, there's something called Tate duality, which takes a very similar form with one twist. So the twist is that the dualizing sheaf is non-trivial in the number field case, but it's trivial in the Riemann surface case. Over here, you, the dualizing sheaf is a Tate twist, which is uh, how the Galois group acts on roots of unity, which is a non-trivial action. But other than that, the analogy works pretty well. Um, okay. And so motivated by this analogy, one might wonder if the following is true. And so, Let's see, I'm not supposed to. No. All right, so in topology, uh, a theorem that I believe is quite useful is understanding what uh, restriction looks like if you take a local system on the, on the entire solid neighborhood and restrict it to the boundary. So let me write this. So in topology, well, okay, I jumped ahead of myself. The first, piece of, first observation is that Poincaré duality uh, implies that if you think about the space of local systems uh, on this Riemann surface, it actually has a symplectic structure. It's not just a uh, space, it actually has a nice pairing on the tangent space. So I'll just write it as loc fp of this guy is, has, a, has a symplectic structure. Uh, essentially, tangent spaces to the space of local systems are given by cohomology with coefficients in the adjoint local system, and then Poincaré duality will give you a symplectic structure on that. And what happens is that if you look at the restriction map on local systems from the solid uh, three-manifold M to its boundary, uh, this map is actually Lagrangian. So let's say at the level of tangent spaces, uh, the tangent space here is Lagrangian inside the tangent space here. Uh, and so this could be some structure that you could try to probe on the arithmetic side. We already have an analog of uh, FP local systems on the boundary, which is uh, Galois representations of GK. If you have a candidate analog of this quantity over here, local systems in the entire three manifold, which I'm proposing is F gauges, then there should be some analog of this statement over here. And there is. So the theorem is the following. 
So again, it's because, because the dualizing sheaf is non-trivial, uh, the Lagrangian statement also has to be formulated carefully because the symplectic structure is not saying that some vector space is self-dual. It's saying some vector space and some other vector space have a canonical perfect pairing. And so the correct thing to do over here is the following. So for any F gauge, E on OK, meaning my candidate local system on OK, which is a candidate point of uh, the space over here, uh, we get the following assertion. So the, there exists a natural exact sequence, or exact triangle, I guess, that looks like so. So here you have cohomology of the F gauge itself. Um, which is sort of some analog of the tangent space over here. It maps to the tangent space over here, which is going to be some Galois cohomology of the corresponding Galois representation. Now, Galois cohomology has a Tate duality. So by local Tate duality, uh, this is the same as the linear dual of the Galois cohomology of the dual complex, which is T of E dual with a Tate twist by one. And I have to keep track of the shift. I think it's a shift by two. So sorry, this is a very complicated looking way of saying uh, I have a duality with a twist by one and a shift by two. Um, and this was a map eta E. And because now I have the same kind of structure showing up over here where it's T of E dual, I can do the analogous map for the dual. So eta E dual goes to same thing over here. And then the claim is that this is actually an exact triangle. And so because the dualizing sheaf is non-trivial, it's not quite the same sim as simple as saying that something is Lagrangian. But it's essentially saying that under the sort of symplectic structure you see uh, on the tangent space in the middle, uh, the thing coming from the integral structure on E and the thing coming from the integral structure on the dual are annihilators of each other. Uh, and this is true in complete generality, so just with perfect complexes. Uh, in particular, it gives some refinement of, an, so after inverting P, this was known by Bloccato, uh, but it gives some integral refinement of what Bloccato were doing. And for me, at least, this was one of the motivations for pursuing this theory of F gauges. So I thought I would try to explain it. Uh, great. Sorry, got a little technical, but are there any questions about the statement? This is the second time I've tried to explain this, and I guess it's just a bad idea. Sorry? Oh, T is the etal realization. So it's the thing that takes the F gauge and produces the Galois representation out of it. Um, yeah. No, fuck. Sorry, are there other questions I can answer while I make a fool of myself? Uh huh. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You're getting three dimensions in this quasi-coherent world, but that's because we are thinking of our local systems as quasi-coherent chiefs somewhere. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Ah. Good question. I, I haven't thought about it, so yeah, I don't. I'm sure the answer is yes. I think the picture is too good to not, for that not to be the case, but I just don't know what the correct formulation is. Um, yeah. Other questions? Okay, so in terms of timing, I have 10 minutes. Is that correct? Okay, so I have 10 minutes to talk about algebraic topology if there are no more questions about number theory. 
Uh, let's see if I can do it. Uh, so really, it's about algebraic k-theory. This is the third application I told you about. Um, and uh, what's the context? So the context is uh, something that's classical in topology. So if you have, let's say, a space, a nice enough space X, and you have some generalized cohomology theory, E, which I'm, the case I have in mind usually is, is K theory, but you could do much fancier versions. So in that case, uh, there's a theorem, uh, which is due to Atiyah and Herzberg, uh, which essentially says that there's a way to compute uh, the E cohomology of X in terms of the singular cohomology of X. Okay, so one way to say it is that there exists a filtration on E star X with associated graded, controlled at least by singular cohomology. So it gives you a way to compute uh, fancy cohomologies of X in terms of simpler cohomologies of X. In this case, E star cohomology, E cohomology of X in terms of singular cohomology of X. Um, so you might wonder what's the analog of this in algebraic geometry. And in algebraic geometry, we have a pretty good analog of complex K theory, which is algebraic K theory. So algebraic K theory is something Quillen defined uh, in the 70s, I think. And it's an invariant you can attach to any, uh, any algebra geometric space. It's really a, ho it's, it's a space, so it has homotopy groups. Uh, and, okay. and uh, you might wonder how you can compute uh, those homotopy groups. Uh, is there some analog of, uh, of the statement that helps you compute algebraic K theory? So this was a question I believe asked by many people. Uh, in, the, uh, in the late 80s, uh, Balenson uh, wrote down his kind of a whole sequence of conjectures on hypothetical properties of the category of motives. And part of uh, those conjectures was a statement that there is something called motivic cohomology, and that motivic cohomology plays the role of singular cohomology if you're interested in algebraic K theory. So algebraic K theory should admit a filtration whose graded pieces are given by motivic cohomology. Uh, in the setting of smooth varieties uh, over a field, and slightly more than that, uh, this was something that was then proven once people had definitions of motivic cohomology. And so there's a whole list of names that goes along with that. Uh, Bloch, Friedlander, Suslin, Levine, Wojewski, of course. Uh, but it brings me to the point I made at the start of these lectures, which is, Motivic cohomology is hard to compute because it's basically algebraic cycles. And algebraic cycles are fundamental and important, but it's rather hard to get your hands on them. And so it would be more useful if there was a version of this theorem where the associative graded was something simpler. And so I want to tell you what the p adic version is. Uh, and this is uh, the combination of a work of a lot of people. I think the end results were due to Clausen, Matthew, Morrow, and uh, myself, Mauro, and Schulze. This is maybe six years ago. Um, and it's the following statement. So say R is a p-adically complete ring. You can just take the ring to be something where some power of p is zero. And that's already highly non-trivial. And so then the statement is that then there exists a filtration of the p-adic completion of a slight modification of k-theory. So what's called a tall k-theory. Uh, so the coefficient zp over here means I do p-adic completion. So there exists a filtration of uh, a tall k-theory with associated graded uh, given essentially by prismatic cohomology. or I guess in the context of these lectures, uh, given by the cohomology of F gauges over R. Rather specific F gauges over R. So there's a recipe to compute uh, this etal K theory of your space uh, as long as you understand how to compute F gauge invariants of your space. And so this is very useful. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, two uh, concrete results that can be proven using, uh, using this idea. 
So this abstract, so really the statement is saying there's some spectral sequence uh, where the E2 term uh, involves F gauges and then the E infinity term involves uh, K theory. So two applications. And I say, I mean, the applications require a lot of work, but this is one of the, uh, one of the major inputs. So one is what we call the odd vanishing theorem. So it's saying that it's some version of bot, of bot vanishing uh, in the setting of algebraic K theory. Uh, and one way to state it is the following. So it says that if you look at the odd homotopy groups of K theory, oops, uh, then they vanish uh, quasi, so te some technical terms now, quasi symptomic locally. On quasi symptomic rings. Okay. Instead of spelling out what these words mean, I'll just tell you an example. So, example, uh, what this says is one special case of this is that the odd K theory of uh, ZP bar, so uh, the absolute integral closure of ZP mod P to the n is zero for all n. Um, so for n equals uh, one, uh, this can be deduced uh, from existing work in the area. For n bigger than one, uh, I don't believe it can, although I'm not a homotopy theorist. But anyways, this is not the super interesting theorem. I, the one I wanted to emphasize is the even vanishing theorem, which I think is really amazing. So this is from last year in the work of Antio, Krause, and Nicolas in 2022. Well, actually, there's only an announcement yet, but I think the full paper will be out soon. Uh, and they prove, essentially, that if you're interested in the k-theory of rings that look like z mod p to the n, so very simple rings like z mod 4, uh, there is an algorithm, like a computer algorithm, which you can program to spit out those groups. And one of the patterns they notice in this algorithm and then prove is the following, which is called the even vanishing theorem. It says pi 2k of z mod p to the n uh, oh, sorry, k-theory of z mod p to the n, uh, is zero for k sufficiently large, depending on n. So, for again, for n equals one, so if you're working in characteristic p, this is Quillen's calculation that started off uh, the field of algebraic k-theory. For n bigger than one, uh, I think it's new already for, for z mod four. Uh, and it's, again, I think it's definitely a question that was probably asked in the early 70s. Uh, and so one of the inputs that goes into both of these theorems is this cohomology of F gauges, more precisely something that's called syntomic cohomology. So I thought I would at least uh, I would mention it in these lectures. I think I have a minute left and a lot more that I wanted to say, so let me not say it. I will just end with a remark that I'm happy to talk to people about, uh, which concerns the following. So, in the topology discussion, oops, ah. uh, the statement was formulated for a generalized cohomology theory E. It could be E, could be anything. It could be K theory, it could be elliptic cohomology, it could be complex cobordism, it could be whatever you want. Uh, in the rest of the algebra geometric discussion, I almost immediately specialized to talking about algebraic K theory. I didn't talk about the fancier invariants. Uh, and part of the reason is that the fancier invariants don't really have a good definition. And even if they did have a definition, uh, we don't have an analog of this picture there. But uh, Jacob has conjectured, and he has a rather precise conjecture about what, things, what should happen. So Lurie has conjectured that the whole picture above extends to arbitrary generalized cohomology theories. Extends to all cohomology theories. So in particular, the conjecture is predicting that there is a well-behaved version of, let's say, elliptic cohomology in the setting of algebraic geometry. So in this analogy between algebraic topology and algebraic geometry, the role of singular cohomology is being played by prismatic cohomology. The role of complex k-theory is being played by algebraic k-theory. And then the whole slew of other invariants on the topological side are conjectured to have analogs in algebraic geometry, which are moreover related 
to the cohomology of F gauges uh, in the same way. Uh, and I think this is a kind of a really fun direction uh, for the subject. And so let me end my talks there. Ah, maybe Barry is the better person to answer this question. Right, and then I think, yeah, Fontaine and uh, Janssen had this definition of F gauges, I think, inspired by this in the characteristic P context, and then this is just copying that. Yes, yes, yes. And I think gauge, because it's like, I think an F gauge structure is like an F crystal structure where you have kind of more refined information, like some kind of a filtration that tells you how far the Frobenius is from being an isogeny. And so it's, I think a gauge is like something that measures something else, and so this filtration is like the measurement. Well, right, so are you, sorry, are you complaining that I didn't actually simplify the situation because I'm still talking about K theory? Meaning two, two algebraic cycles? No, 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 so the point, sorry, I, maybe I should have, so the cohomology of F gauges is the analog of motivic cohomology. And so this is saying that the cohomology of F gauges filters uh, not quite algebraic K theory, there is this etal decoration. And so that's sort of the difference between motives and F gauges. And it went away over here because uh, of something special about these rings. Yeah, so you're only computing etal K theory. And so this is a good point, because now I get to mention uh, that uh, Eldon and Tom Bachman and Matthew Morrow have work in progress giving an analog of the actual motivic filtration for any QCQS scheme over a field, uh, not just smooth varieties as in the classical context. And it's by sort of gluing some of these constructions to some other constructions, which I don't fully understand. Ah. Right, but only rationally. Right, Orlov's conjecture is that the rational motive is determined by the derived category of coherent sheaves. And so I don't think that should have an analog here because this is very integral somehow. Yeah, uh, the category of F gauges is a, a tall sheaf. It's even a quasi-syntomic sheaf. Sorry? Well, their K theory is a very simple ring. K theory of ZP bar mod P to the N does have a tall descent because there are no interesting a covers of ZP bar mod P to the N. So I'm cheating a little bit. I mean, you know, you do what you, you do what you can do.